What is up? Welcome back to another edition of the PFF Podcast. I'm Mike Renner. Joining me today is Steve Palazzolo. Feels good to be back, Steve. And we're doing a little something different over the course of the offseason here. Obviously, we had the draft podcast going, uh, heading leading up to the draft. But now it's post-draft. We've done draft review. We've done all that. And it's the doldrums of the NFL season. Nothing going on, really. So the early week podcast, the Monday-Tuesday podcast, is going to be more news-centric, more football-centric. What's going on? If there is any news, if there's not any news, we'll talk about whatever we feel like talking about NFL-wise. But then the late-week podcast, as we introduced last week, is going to be a history of PFF. We're going to be interviewing people that were crucial and critical to how this company was founded, how it's developed throughout the years. And then we're also going to be doing some podcasts about how we grade, how we grade offensive line play, what, you know, what's basically some behind the scenes look at what we're actually doing on Sundays while the games are going on, that sort of stuff. So we hope you'll enjoy those. We know you already did for the last week when, when Steve and Sam broke it down, but Steve, here we are on monday may 15th and the news of the day this is how you know it's the doldrums of the nfl season of the nfl calendar the news is that eddie lacy weighed in at 253 pounds officially making under his weight and earning a fifty-five thousand dollar bonus how how lit is that good for eddie (laughs) i mean that is for those who doubted eddie lacy and his dedication to the seattle seahawks you know, he just comes out there, proves the doubters wrong, and he doesn't tip the skills at an even 255 or even 254. He doesn't even tempt <laughs> fate. He comes in at 253. I feel like that $55,000 bonus should be up even further being two <laughs> pounds underweight. I'm happy. I'm happy for Eddie. Good job. Am I the Eddie only Lacey. one? You said you said he gave put a little two-pound buffer in there. I feel like two pounds is nothing to Eddie, though. That's like a heavy breakfast. Like, if you... I think he still was cutting it a little too close, for my opinion. I still think he, like, I would have made, I would have given his, myself at least five pound buffer there. His weight fluctuation is so impressive. It really is a day to day thing. Uh, it honestly, to to make fifty five thousand dollars, all he had to do is not drink water for the last twelve hours, and he and he probably made it. So maybe you're right. It's a little bit too close for comfort. But look, I'm proud of him. You know, he could it could have been two sixty five, Mike. It was too. <laughs> 53. When's the next checkup? What's he going to do? Did he just go buffet style right now and then uh, yeah, he's going down just, when it gets close? He's going to go get absolutely after it. Going to be at the Chinese buffet for the next week. Uh, but he weighed in as pro day back in, what was that, 2013 at 231 pounds and still was not very fast. He was still running like a 4.6, mid 4.6s at a pro day. What, what kind of what kind of 40 is he running at 250 now? What is he like? <laughs> is he running four eights? Is he in the Maurice Claret range at this point? I, I don't know. I'm. I, I, he's still elusive enough. He still can make people miss. He, he's still pretty good, even when he's fat. That's why I like Eddie Lacy. He's still pretty good even when he's overweight. I don't care what his 40 is. We that is probably the, rerun it though. Just that is the. <laughs> I would love to see that one. But that's the crazy thing about Lacy. Like he said, you know, running backs. Don't come in all shapes and sizes and whatever, but he was still very effective last year when he was in. He broke 19 tackles on 71 carries. Latavius Murray only broke 20 tackles on 195 carries last year. And he's now, slim, maybe, Latavius. He's in, he's yeah. in shape. And Latavius is, yeah, Latavius jacked. Lacey's just a fat guy out there getting the ball. Uh, so Those stats, by the way, you can find in our new PFF Elite membership, which We've just introduced this week the signature stats that we offered in the past are now back with that membership. You can find those there. But yeah, this thing, Lacey is still, like, like he is the closest thing to Marshawn Lynch when he's in. So I get why the Seahawks wanted to get him, and I get why you put those restrictions on his weight, because he is one of the closest things to Marshawn Lynch in the league when he is felt. And even when he's not, even when he's a little fat, he's still pretty damn good between the tackles. So he, he is. He can make guys miss. Pretty good little spin move. He's he knows the system. He can run that zone scheme. Look, I, he's worth a shot. He's worth a shot, and it's going to be a great story. You know, hey, this is a better story than Deflategate, in my opinion. It could be mid-May Deflategate stuff. Instead, it's going to be Eddie Lacy's weight taking us through the spring and summer. I'm all in. Yeah. So there's. By June or sometime in June and August, he has to weigh 250. So that's the next one. 55,000 more for that. 
And sometime in September, uh, in between September and December, he has to stay under 245. So those are his ones, $55,000 for each, which, you know, I don't know what kind of, it says a lot about the USA where he gets, you know, $55,000 just for some self-control, whereas police officers who risk their lives every day don't even get that for a year, but, Jeez, Mike, you know. getting philosophical on us here. You're getting <laughs> no, political, just, philosophical. You know, I'm joking. Uh, but, that, that, so those are the incentives, think, so look forward to Eddie Lacy's uh, Weight Watch uh, in the future. All right, Th- that's the big news of the day, though. The secondary news, and this, uh, again, you can tell it's the offseason, Orlando Franklin, a left guard for the Los Angeles Chargers, was cut today, Steve. So much potential on that that San Diego line the past two years. It's fallen. It was legitimately awful a season ago. Actually, both the last two seasons. It was legitimately terrible when they went on somewhat of a spending spree to try to fix it, didn't do anything. Like I've said before, it was assembled on an Indian burial ground. <laughs> Indian burial ground. Burial ground. I, I had some high hopes for competency in 2015 for the Chargers offensive line. They brought in Orlando Franklin, who was coming off of three excellent seasons, and I thought that he would help shore up one of the guard positions. They were putting DJ Fluker inside at guard full time, which I thought would at least, you know, you know, take him from a below average right tackle to at least an average guard. You had King Dunlap outside, who was a competent left tackle. It just did not work out at all for any of these guys. Uh, Franklin included. Franklin went from dr- grading at 85.2 in 2014. He signs the free agent deal, and then goes 38.8 on our <laughs> zero to 100 scale. 38.8. That's bright red. <laughs> below average and then ups his game to 47.5 overall last year still in the bright red uh i had heard that he'd been playing banged up but it certainly i mean there were times he just wasn't getting off the ball and guys were flying by him it was just ugly all around for franklin so i thought it was a decent move at the time did not pan out and yeah that charges offensive line was horrendous i have to go back real quick to the the dolphins game last year i have never seen this perfectly arranged terrible offensive line performance that directly affected the quarterback and it was you know philip rivers every time he dropped back to pass you've got sue in his face you have guys in his face left and right and it was literally from a different angle every single drop back he was pressured almost every single drop back and the ball just started coming out of his hands quicker and quicker and quicker so by the time you got to the fourth quarter you have rivers not even under pressure just chucking passes up four interceptions later in the fourth quarter in this disastrous, you know, typical Chargers collapse last year. But I felt like it was just that whole offensive line being so bad the entire game. So it it really is amazing. Just if you go back and watch from a season ago, the Chargers offensive line, just the pockets Philip Rivers has on a consistent basis versus someone like Dak Prescott, where Rivers is just like, it it looks like a, uh, like a room, like a circular room, just closing in. Like the walls are get, like shrinking on him from a every single angle. snap. Like, it was yeah, like all every angles? single off lineman yeah. from every single snap is just bull rush straight into his lap, and he's not. He, he's like he's jumping upwards because there's no like pocket to step up in. So I like love that jump, the, jump. Path the only yeah, the only space is like up in the air for him to go into. It, <laughs> it was atrocious. And then, and then you have Dak, he'll move up, and then, ah, I got nothing, I'll move to the right a little bit, let me backtrack yeah. a little bit, okay, now I'll find my open man. It, it was like night and day, that line, it was either one, so it was definitely collapsing from all angles on every play, and then one guy would just get straight whooped, and it'd be like a straight line, a straight run at Rivers <laughs> from at least one defender, but you didn't know where it was coming from, it was mm-hmm. always fun, it was... It was pretty bad, but I think there are signs of life, right? There's some hope for the Chargers O-line going forward. I was going to say, so that hope you saw back in 2015, they kind of went on that similar, <laughs> you know, revamping of that line here heading into 2017. And now at left tackle, you have Russell Okun, who should at least, while not an amazing pass blocking left tackle, should at least be an upgrade from what they had in King Dunlap. Left guard, you have Forrest Lamp, who we loved going into the uh, the draft and think should be able to start it, come in and start right away and be easily an upgrade for them, if not one of the better guards in football. At center, you have either Max Turk or Matt Slauson. Uh, both, we had, we had high hopes for Turk coming out. He was a third rounder back in 2016, but missed uh, most of his rookie season because of injury. And Slauson's been one of the better centers uh, over his time in the NFL. And then right guard Dan Feeney, we liked out of Indiana. And then Joe Barksdale at right tackle. Is this the year the curse is lifted on that offensive line, Steve? 
I think there are at least steps moving forward. There's probably as much as we do love I think Forrest changing, Lamb. changing also going to Los Angeles might be what actually lifts the curse as well. That's really what it is. Getting out of San Diego. <laughs> And nice job just sticking with Los Angeles all the way through, knowing exactly where they're from. It's not easy. You know, I've missed transition. it multiple times already this draft season. So, Well, your mind's well-rested after taking, what, a month and a half off for vacation? It's a week so. and a half. No big, I, I mean, Felt like we longer. Did. We miss you. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. You're lucky but... we let you back on the pod. But I, I think they've at least taken steps back in the right direction. You know, there's a lot. There's high expectations if you if you think that Forrest Lamp and Dan Feeney are just going to come in and play, you know, outstanding guard right away. You know, outst- mm-hmm. to expect outstanding guard play right away from two rookies is probably a little rich. But I think it's the steps in the right direction. I- again, as much as we love Forrest Lamp, you know, you can't expect Pro Bowl play right away. But it looks like they're on the in, in you know on the right path. Max Turk, I'm with you, man. We had third round pick. We had him as a borderline second, I believe, coming out of 2000, in 2016. Very good athlete. Uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of Ethan Posick this year, who I Ooh. think Posick's going to play. He's an athletic center for six foot seven. Turk's more <laughs> athletic, but athletic for six foot seven. Could play guard. Could play tackle. Turk dabbled at guard and tackle, or could dabble at guard and tackle. Uh, I think he's got really good potential at center. So you're talking about you know three young guys making up the interior of that offensive line. So I think the future, at least, is bright for the Los Angeles Chargers. But again, here's the thing. It can't get worse. You know, you literally can't get worse. So that, that's uh, my take on it. But here's my – here's my. I've said it before, LA Chargers this year, dark horse, Super Bowl contender. Super I'm Bowl calling it right now, contender? dark horse. Just like the Raiders season to go in the AFC West, I think the Chargers are bound, are poised for that – sort of bump, sort of, you know, jump to the next level. Am I am I crazy? No, no, I agree on the bump. Yeah, I mean, I would have said playoff contender. You said Super Bowl contender. I, I would have said playoff contender. That's exactly contender. what I said. Yeah, okay. I would have said playoffs. But well, I, I mean, I that's think not a hot take at all then. It's not that hot, I know. But look, they've Joey Bosa, the one-man wrecking crew on the defensive side of the ball. Jason Verrett, Casey Hayward opposite each other now at corner. Uh, solid inside linebackers with Denzel Perryman and Jatavis Brown. You've got Melvin Ingram back off the edge Jeremy Atauchu I mean you've got play, you've got some players now I mean that defense was absolutely horrendous a couple of years ago as well both lines pretty bad and they could still use they still need more bodies up front next to Bosa I mean they still mm-hmm. need some big bodies you know they're trying to get a little something out of Brandon Meebane up front this year we'll see what happens there so they could still use some big bodies up front but they they have a lot more playmakers on that defense now than they did a few years ago as well. So I think the roster as a whole, offense and defense, certainly on the way up. Well, and here's why I'm excited. It's the offense more than defense for me. Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, Tyrell Williams, Antonio Gates, Hunter Henry, Melvin Gordon. If that offensive line actually gives Phillip Rivers time, Mike Williams is this is the perfect place for Mike Williams to go, in my opinion, because I said he needed to go to a place where a quarterback would give him, you know, 50-50 balls, give him chances to make plays. And Phillip Rivers is that guy who will do that that is a quarterback who will let you make plays down the field even if you're not necessarily open so I think this is an offense that could also make large strides going forward and I I think much like the Raiders last year where both sides look to be both you know vastly improved I I think that's what we're going to see from LA yeah I'm with you I think you know Rivers still has plenty left in the tank you know I think a big a big part of his production has been based off the offensive line, forcing passes into coverage. That's why he threw so many interceptions both the last couple of years. Still very, very capable. And I like that combination. Mike Williams, I hope Keenan Allen stays healthy because when he's healthy, he was the guy that I compared Corey Davis to, the guy that was competing with Mike Williams for that top wide receiver off the board spot. Of course, Corey Davis goes number five overall to Tennessee, but Allen has that shifty route running. He's the guy that gets open. Mike Williams creates the big plays or just moves the chains. Doesn't have to be open, has that big body. So, yeah, I like I like the variety of playmakers that they have. And even if the offensive line isn't better, you can still, you know, instead of Rivers throwing the ball up to the defense, he can throw it up to Mike Williams now. So mm-hmm. so that's a big uh, that's a big bonus. Chargers, you're going to get on board? Super I was going to say, you're going to get on board with the Super Bowl take? I just talked to myself in. It's May 15th. You could probably <laughs> give me any team, and I'll talk myself into putting them in the playoffs or the Super Bowl. Because there we go. It's the off season. It's eternal <laughs> optimism in the off. Yes, it is. And one more piece of news. This is how exciting it's been over the past week. Is that Brandon Albert isn't talking with the Jaguars, even though he was traded there. Hasn't said a word to Doug Marone. 
so, since being traded. Does that include... Some feelings have been hurt, apparently, and both sides uh, are tucked into their corners. But does that and, include yeah. social media? Like, have they... <laughs> Have they, DM'd? they haven't, no DMs, no, no, they haven't Snapchatted, even though I think they traded names on you don't Snapchat. You know, those delete every day, so you don't <laughs> really know. Then nobody can check that. I don't know what Brandon Albert's endgame here is. He was, one, traded for a seventh rounder. There was, right there should show you, like, the market that he had in terms of, of, like, for a new contract. You were traded for basically nothing. Your salary at this point is $9 million this year. Like, if you get cut, you don't see that money. He's not going to see $9 million on the open market. That's barely what Andrew Whitworth got. Brandon Albert's 32. Obviously, Whitworth's a few years older, but Albert's nowhere near you know, where Whitworth was. Albert, this season ago, was our 58th highest-graded tackle. And even when he was better in 2015, he was our 33rd highest-graded tackle. And the thing about Albert is he, he can't stay healthy. He's five straight seasons now where he's missed significant time. His max over that span is only 883 snaps in the season. So that's just, you need a left tackle that has reliability. He is not that guy at this point. I'm not sure his end game. He needs to show up ASAP basically. And the Jaguars just drafted his replacement, his eventual replacement expected replacement in Cam Robinson. Is that what it is? Is it hurt feelings? Is he, I don't know when you're, when you're this aging left tackle that's just gotten traded for a seventh rounder and they happen to draft another offensive tackle. Like did it really hit you off guard? Did it really like come out of the blue? Oh, I can't believe that they're looking to move on from me, 30, 32 year old Brandon Albert. You know, I, I I don't even try to get into the psyche of offensive linemen. That's I tried once and I got roasted on Twitter. So I will try to get into the psyche of <laughs> offensive line coaches this weekend. Okay. Cool, cool clinic. Oh yeah. How about that Good. drop? Nice drop. Little PFF presentation coming out this weekend for all of the fun offensive line coaches around the NFL college. So going to be uh going to be diving into that this weekend that should be a good time but you're right the offensive line offensive line men and coaches kind of their own breed but i think the jaguars went into this with the right they went in with the right attitude right we kept saying with cam robinson he's a second round type of player and a guy that you know they have to get they, you need a coach to get the best out of him so <laughs> they brought him on expecting hey we got brandon albert for a year cam robinson maybe takes over next year we try to groom him. We try to maximize his potential, Mike, his upside. Oh, yeah. Cam Robinson. Right into the no, that, I think I think in that sense you can use it. Oh, okay. I could say that. Yeah. But that's what the Jaguars were thinking when they did this whole thing. Now, if they if, – if, if Albert ends up holding out forever or whatever it is and Cam Robinson has to play now, that could get ugly too because I don't know that he's – I don't know that he's ready to step in as starting tackle in the NFL just yet. You know, again, potential wise, no, yeah. you could you see you see why people liked Cam Robinson, but you certainly see why despite all of the physical tools that he has, he went in the second round and not the first round. So that's that's the side effect to this whole thing. Is Cam Robinson going to be in the starting lineup earlier than expected? No, yeah. I I I just don't see what Brandon Albert has to gain here. I'm pretty sure within the next month or so, he's going to be talking to the Jaguars and will be this will all blow over and he'll be their starting left tackle come week one. So I'm not too worried about that. That is it, though, for news. The NFL is slow right now. There's will, no denying that. Will we have an emergency follow-up podcast if Brandon Albert does start <laughs> talking to the Jaguars? We'll have. Uh, yeah, it'll be a short. We'll uh, literally be probably about 10 seconds, and it will say Brandon Albert has started talking to the Jaguars. Uh, I think it's worth that's it. about it. Our <laughs> listeners need that update. I think that's that's a worthwhile move. We care about you guys for sure. Yeah, we'll we'll bite the bullet, make time out of our day, no matter what it happens. So look forward to that. On to some segments then, because that is it for NFL news. There's really nothing going on, and that's gonna bring me right into what grinds Mike's gear. Sam's not here right now, so we're gonna I'm gonna steal this one from him, and it's the fact that in the summer there's not a developmental league for the NFL. There's nothing for me to talk about. There's no NFL Europe anymore. There's nothing, you know, there's no games going on. There's nothing for me to do for the next two months. I mean, there's something for me to do. I obviously, this is my job. I get paid to do stuff for PFF, but there's nothing actually interesting going on. And that pisses me off in the end because there's, I feel like the NFL, this enormous company that has multiple billions of dollars of revenue every year knows that people love, you know, knows that people crave football year-round. They've 
created this atmosphere of it that they're the biggest news story year in, year out. Why not create a league like the NBDL, like minor league baseball, something in the summer, like you the know XFL. people would watch. Yeah, you know people would watch it. I, I just, it's going to happen sometime within the next five to ten years. We Book keep it. hearing that it's going to happen. What is keeping it from happening? Look, I'm, I'm kind of with you, but you're also at the, sa- at the same time, you have the NFL banging the drum about player safety and cutting back reps in practice and all this different stuff, and then you're going to add more games. And I understand that the people well, this that would is, be playing yeah. in these games are different from the players that will be playing on Sunday. Mm-hmm. But sometimes, though, it's it's the message. It's about the message, right? If, if you're over there saying it's about player safety, and then you're over there saying, well, we have to have an 18-game schedule because that's going to make us more money, then those things kind of contradict each other. Same thing with if you're going to play a D-League, uh, we're going to cut back on reps and, and, and all that I stuff. I wonder if that is league, it. I wonder if that is the whole thing. It's basically the revenue you would generate from any sort of developmental league is not going to offset the potential lawsuit you could get in the future from those, you know, no-name players uh, getting head injuries and whatnot. Now, at the same time, look, I, from, as a football fan, obviously I would love it. It would give us a little bit more to do. It would give us a little bit more work in the spring, more guys to grade. But you talk about all those college guys that we've evaluated. I mean, when you go through the draft class, there are hundreds of guys that you see that can contribute on NFL rosters, and a lot of them just need a little bit more experience. You could definitely see them because we just went through this, Mike. Mm -hmm. You know, the the, the 30th edge defender, the 30th linebacker in our rankings might never get a shot at the NFL level, even if he has something to contribute. Might be a great run stopper. Might be great in coverage. He might have something to contribute at the NFL level, but never really have the opportunity because they're only going to suit up five linebackers a week, and they're only going to suit up seven offensive linemen a week. So all of the complaints that have mm-hmm. gone to the you know to that that players have had, you know, the offensive linemen don't have enough time to practice together, and quarterbacks can't develop because they never get any reps. That's what this whole thing would would try to solve and try to get more reps and get a cleaner brand of football. So. I certainly see. I think it would help a lot for offensive line play, especially. I think just Absolutely. getting guys at the bottom of the roster who have been blocking, you know, who have played another season, you know, who have played like maybe four seasons under their belt, even if they haven't actually been playing on a, in the NFL games. I think that would help enormously because the guys just sit there at the end, maybe get a handful of reps throughout the week, but they're not actually developing like a. You know, like someone would in college if they kept staying in college for the next four or five years. So, And we keep it, hearing about the transition from spread offense in college to pro style and all that stuff. And even though those things are – I think the NFL needs to do a better job of adjusting to mm-hmm. those types of things. This would help accelerate that process, right? You've got yeah, but it's like, guys yeah, that need exactly. to learn. With, you know, they have to learn through repetition and doing it in a game situation. Yeah, a lot of times if you don't get it within that first six months, all of a sudden you're, you know, SOL. You're that's your career. It's over because you didn't make that transition quick enough to make a practice squad or a roster, and then all of a sudden, you know, that's it for your NFL career. When maybe you could have over time, but it just your your college coaches sucked and didn't know how to teach you to kick slide and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's a no brainer to me. Grinding my gears, and well, I'm gonna be salty about it for the next two months now. So, why don't you do something about it? <laughs> yeah, me. I'll start. Why don't lead. you make it happen, Mike? All right. When, when I'm commissioner, I'll. It'll definitely. That'll be priority number one. That's the attitude. On to explain this. We still haven't come up with a better name for this segment, but football term of the week: fire zone, Steve. You've probably heard this uh, somewhere. Uh, you probably you might not even you might even know what it means. But Steve, give the people what a breakdown of what Fire Zone is. Well, for for Ben Stockwell's ears, our director of analysis, the first thing I think of is busted coverage. Yes. Because we because we, we're all convinced that the Fire Zone never works, but I think we only remember the ones that don't work. It does work every now and again. The basic concept of the fire zone is it's a five-man blitz with a three-under, three-deep coverage behind it. Now, the the trick here that I think everybody gives credit to the Pittsburgh Steelers of the 1990s for kind of making popular under under Dick LeBeau, the, the fire zone, and their ability to, you know, they weren't sending 18 guys every single snap. That's illegal. But they weren't sending eight guys on the blitz. It might have, it felt like that sometimes, but they were only sending five. 
the the key is where they're coming from. Are you going to send two linebackers? Are you going to send a linebacker and a nickel back? Are you going to send, you know, two corners? A lot of times you it's it's you mix it up and you're sending five and the key is there's going to be three zone defenders dropping to shallow zones and there's going to be three defenders playing a three deep shell. Now they all have different rules. It's not this pure cover zone. I mean, cover grass type of zone. You're going to match up with receivers differently. And I feel like that's why it's challenging on the defense because, you know, each defender has specific rules. It's like, all right, if this guy goes beyond five yards, you got to run with him and carry him. If, if he, you know, if he, you know, runs a shallow cross, then you pass him off. And it's challenging on the defense because there's only six defenders but you're hoping that those first five, those five that are rushing, can get to the quarterback in time and also keep the offensive line off balance enough that you get a free run at the quarterback. That's a basic idea of fire zone. Did I miss anything in there? No, that was pretty good. Yeah, and it's basically, uh, like you hinted on, the uh, the matchup aspect. It's very much like a zone in basketball, not, uh, not like a pure zone coverage that you'd think of, like you said, guys just dropping to a spot. It's like a zone in basketball where – you're passing off routes depending on where they go, uh, just like you're passing off players on a basketball court depending on where they go on the field. So your different route concepts will take a uh, you know the middle, the underneath defender in the middle, the hook defender. It could take him you know up to see him. It could take him anywhere depending on where the routes come from. So yeah, that's the basic gist of it. And like like you said, I don't I don't think it's I think it leaves. A lot of room for busted coverage just because of that matchup aspect where one guy F's up and there are gaping holes in it, I feel like. so. Well, a lot of times, it's you know, if you have a trips formation, so you have three receivers <laughs> on one side and they're basically flooding, you know, they're flooding the field, you know, it's, it's very difficult for the defense to properly match up. And sometimes you just have the perfect play call that almost throws all those rules out the window for the defense and somebody's going to come wide open. So when you have... When you have a good quarterback, most good quarterbacks who are experienced have seen every type of fire zone at you know at some point. Mm-hmm. So it's very difficult to fool them. There's a lot of holes in the defense, and usually your best quarterbacks can can find the open man. Yeah, so I, I think it is actually moving out of vogue, so to speak, and pure man blitzes are probably more in vogue. I, is that is that a fair assessment? Oh, I think that's fair. And it, and then so now if you do the same if you do the same thing with a man blitz, you bring five. Now you definitely have to get rid of the ball quicker as a quarterback. And then there's the chance that you know all five guys that you'll have five guys manned up and you'll have one guy as probably a deep zone defender, right? right. So there's a chance that all five guys that are left in man coverage, all you know a couple of them might actually not actually have to man up depending on the protection scheme. You might have might have an extra running back staying in to protect. But there's a good chance that those guys can play tight press man coverage for the two, two and a half seconds that you need to throw off the timing of the play versus mm-hmm. a fire zone that kind of leaves more open grass, so to speak, because you're trying to disguise it and then match the routes instead of just saying, look, we're playing we're playing press man coverage and we're bringing five and you got to get rid of the ball quickly. So And yeah, and it's tough to press in fire zone because basically right. if you have to pass off a route from press position, you're leaving yourself very susceptible to you know, losing that route. That's a good point. Yeah, it's more the defenders. The defenders are trying to keep, you know, eye the quarterback, read the route concepts, and then adjust accordingly versus man coverage. You're just locking in on your man and, and trying mm-hmm. to stay with him. All right, well, that's fire zone. That's, uh, that's the, explain this for this week. Uh, let's keep it moving on to our last segment here, some historical power rankings. And in honor of our boy, Eddie Lacy, we're going to do the top five fat running backs in NFL history. I'll break it off. Number five, I even mentioned him earlier, Maurice Claret. He was absolutely enormous after he took his year off. Ran a 4.8640 at the combine and basically ate his way out of the NFL. Didn't even see the field. So there was there was a point, you know, he challenged that that whole rule to come out as a freshman, mm-hmm. and then right after his career ended, Adrian Peterson came in, or just as his career was, they, they had, there was a little crossover there. But it was like Claret came in, and he was like the greatest true freshman we've seen, you know, since Herschel Walker. And then Adrian Peterson comes in, and he was like the greatest freshman we've seen since Maurice Claret and since Herschel Walker. And I think everybody at the time was like, yeah, you know, Claret's onto something. Let him get to the NFL. 
and he sits out and he can't go back to Ohio State and before you know it he just ate himself right out of the NFL like you said and it was like yeah maybe this rule's a, a good one stay in school kids yeah who'd you have for number five Steve okay so my number five I'm gonna go Jerome Bettis I think he just Ooh. needs uh, there are other guys that I enjoyed watching over Jerome Bettis even though he's a Hall of Famer and I just had to throw him in on the list so he's the token number five for Bettis he's the token fat running back that is quintessential you guy. think yeah, I was saying, quintessential yeah. better than yeah, think fat running back. You think Jerome Bettis? That's actually why I had him at number one. So it's just too it's just too classic Jerome Four Bettis. Number four though, I had Ron Dane, the old school Ron Dane before he tried to revitalize his career and actually lose some weight. Uh, back Wisconsin Ron Dane when he was just running over guys who were actually smaller than him. Most <laughs> pretty much every one he faced. I loved him back in college. I thought he was awesome. He's my number one. He's my top guy because. Not that he's the best one, just my favorite one, because I thought he was going to actually have that success in the NFL. He was nimble. He he looked nimble for a big guy in college, not so much in the NFL. He had small. He had some spurts though. I thought he'd be much better. Fun fact about Ron Dane: he has the fifth farthest discus throw ever in, by a high schooler. Where where do so you find world this class fact? discus? I don't know. I used to read about Ron Dane a lot. So why but, is he only yeah. four on your list if you know these fun facts? But that would move him up my list. Uh, the, the top three are good. I mean, I already mentioned Bettis. Number three for me was Eddie Lacy. There you so, go. To, you know, going back to uh, the beginning of the podcast, Eddie Lacy, At definitely which, fat. It, I think 2015, when it was like comical, when he, he just like everyone saw that he was like he was losing his wind on a 20 yard run and guys were catching him from like five yards behind. Over the course of 10 yards, like guys are making up incredible ground on him, but he was still just bowling over dudes. I think 2015 Eddie Lacy was my favorite incarnation of yeah. fat. Just the fact yeah. that he was making 20 yard runs is the yeah. impressive part. That's the impressive feat for Eddie Lacy. He's my number four. So, you know, that's mm -hmm. he, he deserves a spot on the list. He's he's he's, he's nimble for a big guy, too. No Again, yeah, the is. nimble big guys. All right. Who do you have at number three? Three. I went Mike Tolbert and, uh, you know, just. Guy keeps ticking. He's still going. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He could run that little fullback dive. Still going. My, I was going to say, my favorite thing about Mike Tolbert is the fact that he gets classified as a fullback purely because he's fat. Like, he's not actually a fullback. He lead blocks less, <laughs> like, he lead blocks maybe like twice a game. He's still but a fullback in my heart. He gets classified as one purely because he's a fat running back. And he makes pro bowls because of it. It's uh, that's that's how you know you've made it as a fat running back when people just call you a fullback, even though you're really not a fullback. Gotta love Mike Tolbert. He's he was number two on my list. So He's number two. So who? What do we have left now? That has who's been two on field? yours? Two on my list. I'm going back to Natron Means. Oh, okay. he holds a special place in my heart because my my teenage years, my very formative football years, I was a diehard. Jaguars fan. Mark Brunel, Jimmy Smith, Keenan McCardell. I jumped on the 1996 Jaguars bandwagon midseason. I won't get into the exact entire story because we could spend a whole podcast on my 96 Jaguars love. But yeah. Natron Means comes out of nowhere and starts running like crazy in the playoffs. And he kind of spurred their whole playoff run that went to the AFC Championship before losing to the Patriots. So Natron Means had a nice little career with San Diego rejuvenated for about three games in Jacksonville and holds a soft spot in my heart as a fat, big running back that's difficult to tackle. Natron means 5'10", 245, definitely qualifies. All right, I, I've said my number one. It was Jerome Bettis. Who was your number one, Steve? And mine was Ron Dane. You know, I okay. That early. So, so yeah. Dane, it, Wisconsin Ron Dane. And honestly, there was like a few runs when he was with the Giants where you're like, all right, I can see it. I can see it. But then... <laughs> At the end of the season, it's like, oh, 3.4 yards per carry. Oh, 3.5 yards per carry. You're just not the same guy that I thought you were going to be coming out. The funny college. thing, though, was like even in college, his stats weren't that good. He just carried the ball far more than anyone's ever carried the ball like in any you know college season. He had 1,200 carries in college. Okay, that'll do it. Yeah. Well, maybe that, <laughs> that explains why he might have been so bad in the NFL. Wear and yeah. tear, man. That is ridiculous numbers. That is all for our show today. We hope you enjoyed it. Later this week, Sam and Steve will be interviewing Neil Hornsby, the founder of PFF, talking basically about 
how the company was founded, where it all came from. Make sure to tune into that. And I can't wait make for sure... that, Mike. I can't. It, yeah. I, I got to jump in for a second. Look, I'm going <laughs> to ask Neil some questions. I haven't even asked him. Go deep. In yeah. person. I mean, we want to get Ooh. into some of the personal story, you know, selling selling the company to Chris, how he started the company, how he started the company and taught someone who doesn't know a lick about football how to program and code and like kind of make the whole thing happen on the website. I've never, I've never truthfully heard how he first approached the Giants or how that even went down, how he that's, first got an NFL customer. That that's will be, be an interesting it. story to hear. Yeah. yeah. We're going to ask about the first NFL customer, how we got up to now 27, uh, you know, basically how we got to this whole deal. So I cannot wait. And if you guys didn't hear the first, you know, the overview podcast, I suggest you go back. That's the last one in the archive. Sam and I gave over an hour, just a little general overview of the history of the company, Sam's story with the company, my story with the company. We've get, we've been getting great feedback from everybody on this one. So I think it's going to be a fun series to kind of take us through the summer. Should be, and I'll be. You guys will be interviewing me at some point in it too. So uh, look that forward to that list. one. Yeah. Better we'll be ready. Make sure mark your calendars. I'm not sure what the date is, but just mark them anyway. Uh, and then make sure to go to our website and check out the new PFF products that we have, PFF Elites, which is the all-inclusive, everything, signature stats, all the old stuff that we took away at one point. Now it's back. And PFF Edge, which is your fantasy products repackaged into one-stop shop, gives you some our grades tool from before all of our projections all of that good stuff so make sure to go check that out at pf we will talk to you guys next week